pop quiz, hot shot. There's a bomb on a bus. Once the bus goes 50 miles an hour, the bomb is armed. If it drops below 50, it blows up. What do you do? What do you do? Upon release in 1994, critics and audiences were blown away with the sheer ferocity and heart-pumping action in the film about a bus. Along with a very likable cast and a wicked smart screenplay, the movie seared itself into popular culture and is one of those films you have to stop and watch when it comes on TV. But what is it about speed that makes it a cut above the rest during the decade of 90s action? That's what we're going to look at today as I review Yann de Bont's directorial debut, Speed. The film opens with a literal bang, as we see a mad bomber, played by Dennis Hopper, holding a group of hostages in an elevator for money. Two LAPD cops, Harry Temple, played by Jeff Daniels, and the protagonist of the film, Jack Traven, played by Keanu Reeves, succeed in outwitting the bomber and save all in the elevator. A short time later, however, the bomber reappears, having rigged a city bus, which will arm when the bus goes over 50 miles per hour and detonate if it drops again below 50. Jack locates the bus, but is too late to stop it from arming. He manages to board the bus, but the driver is injured in an altercation. A passenger, Annie, played by Sandra Bullock, takes the wheel and is forced to navigate through the streets of Los Angeles, while Harry and Mac played by Joe Morton, try to find out who the bomber is and keep the bus moving without slowing down. Right off the bat, Graham Yost showed that he was blessed by the screenwriting gods when he figured out the premise for this movie. A hijacked vehicle and a rigged vehicle have been done before, but this movie uses both setups in fresh ways. Firstly, as the film is set in Los Angeles, it already poses a massive problem as the city is infamous for gridlock traffic, and making the trigger 50 or above during morning rush hour is a fiendishly clever move. Secondly, the movie is set on a bus. Buses aren't known for speed or maneuverability, and yet it has to be handled like the Mustang from Bullet. Again, it's just such a clever move. This already sets up the notion for the audience that things won't exactly be normal. And this problem definitely becomes one that we're excited to see get resolved by the end. As genius as the premise is, it could have been diminished or completely undone by the wrong execution. You also will admit that the dialogue and characters weren't originally up to snuff, and thus the studio tapped Josh Whedon to help punch up the dialogue. With the new snappy dialogue to match the smart and snappy premise, both flow seamlessly, and the story remains interesting. It's all the more impressive when you learn that this movie was Jan de Bont's directorial debut. An esteemed director of photography, particularly for the movies Die Hard, The Hunt for Red October, and Basic Instinct, de Bont was able to make the leap to directing on this film. For a first-timer, he's very capable of handling the characters and the story very well. He directed several more films after this, which are not good films in my opinion. But for such a stunning opening film, I tip my hat to the man. A movie called Speed better be able to deliver, and this movie really does. The action scenes are second to none, and deliver exactly what the title promises. Once the bus hits 50 miles per hour, that's when real trouble begins. Jack and Annie encounter everything, from traffic jams and tight spots, to missing freeway pieces and a runaway train. This movie is packed to the gills. Relying heavily on practical effects and spectacular stunt driving for the bulk of the movie, each is executed to impeccable standards. We feel like we're on the bus with the passengers and crawling under the seats with them. Even the infamous jump between the exposed freeway is a spectacular stunt, and the build-up to it is absolutely nail-biting. The real reason these work is the suspense built up to each event 
is flawless. Roger Ebert famously said about this film, you want to grab the forearm of the person next to you, or as he put it, a Bruce Forer movie. I kind of get the same sense. The action benefits from visual snap by the camera work and the editing. Debunt and director of photography, Andre Bartkowiak, take a page out of the action movie playbook by using strong contrasting orange highlights in the sunrise and sunset hours with the blue and black interiors of the elevator shafts and the subway tunnels. With a visual snap needs a time snap, obviously where the editing comes into play. For me, Speed is one of the best edited action films I've ever seen. The editing gives the movie a precise and crisp pacing, which never flags. And like the best action films, there's plenty of time for the cuts to give us the visual information we need, while still eliciting visceral thrills. Editor John Wright outdid himself on this one, and ultimately earned an Oscar nomination for his cutting. The underrated element of the movie for me is the score by Mark Manchina. This composer has been around Hollywood for decades, and even worked for the likes of Hans Zimmer, and composed many of the great scores like Tarzan, Bad Boys, and recently, Moana. This is a great combination of percussion loops and two strong lead motifs. The main action theme and the melodic romantic slash triumphant theme heard during the end credits. This is a great action score and one that never fails to keep the adrenaline going during the amazing action. The characters are often overlooked when discussing this movie, without good reason. Keanu Reeves as Jack Traven is an oddly fascinating character. In the beginning scene, Harry tests Jack on what to do in a hostage situation. Jack coldly replies that he would shoot the hostage, wound the hostage, mind you, to remove it from the equation. This is followed by him showing off to us how clever he is in trying to outwit the problem. This is great, as this shows that he's dedicated to his job as a cop, but doesn't really care all that much about the people he rescues. For him, it's a job. Even on the bus, he tries to be a touch too professional as the passengers panic. As the journey wears on, he lets go a bit. And when Harry is killed by the bomber, Jack loses it and becomes more fatalistic and concerned for the passengers. He does grow by the end of the movie, which really wouldn't happen if it was a thin characterization. When the bomber hijacks Annie and forces Jack to make the choice, he doesn't do what he said he would. This just goes to show you that there's some very good characterization in this movie and Keanu Reeves does a splendid job. Balancing Jack's tough and professional stance is Sandra Bullock as Annie. She's just a regular woman who almost didn't even get on the bus, but is forced to drive it simply because of mitigating circumstances. She's a bit jittery behind the wheel, but she's still competent enough to comprehend what's happening. Not only is she Jack's foil personality-wise, but eventually becomes like a second partner to him during the crisis. There was even a nice moment from Sandra Bullock that I only caught when I was writing this review. After Harry dies, Jack loses control, and she has to talk him down and remind him of what he needs to do. And she holds his hand tenderly. There's been a budding romance that culminates by the end of the movie, but for me, this was a really sweet touch. It shows how Bullock really does bring the human side to this roller coaster ride. Plus, she and Reeves have insane chemistry, so the romantic subplot doesn't feel at all forced. One of the lines she delivers about relationships based on extreme circumstances is extremely contrived, but even they play it off as a joke, so it lands a little better. And even by the end, they repeat the line it still registers as a nice moment between the two. Naturally for me, when you cast someone like Dennis Hopper as the villain, in this case, Howard Payne, you're in for a treat. Known for playing weirdos and eccentrics in films like Blue Velvet and Apocalypse Now, Hopper here plays the villain like a child playing a game with his enemy. 
downright gleeful at the prospect of toying with Jack and getting money in return. His motivation is money, but again, because of great writing and how Hopper and DeBont go about him, they make the bomber someone who doesn't have a darker meaning behind him, but rather someone who just wants a big pile of money, which maybe will make up for his hand getting damaged. He even learns from his mistakes as how he handles Jack in one regard in the beginning, and is radically different at the end. These two work off one another brilliantly, sort of like how John McClane and Hans Gruber worked off each other in Die Hard, evenly matched in wit and execution. Hopper is just a delight from start to finish, and never once tips the scale into over-the-top camp territory, just keeping it enough that he's a menace, but still fun to watch. The supporting cast is small, but leave indelible marks. Jeff Daniels is, well, Jeff Daniels. Any performance he gives is wonderful, and this is no exception. Playing Harry is someone who loves Jack, but at the same time is sort of sick of his impish ways. Joe Morton, a favorite from Terminator 2, plays Jack's supervisor, Mac, very well, speaking a mile a minute trying to resolve the crisis, while really helpless to do anything without breaking the rules of the game. Alan Ruck is funny as a spaced out tourist, and has great banter with Carlos Carrasco as the Gigantor Ortiz. Glenn Plummer, however, steals the spotlight as the driver of the hijacked Jaguar Jack uses to get on the bus. He is bloody hilarious. When all's said and done, Speed is a well-oiled machine that really works wonders for the audience. But the movie isn't very superficial. There's a small undercurrent theme of compassion throughout the movie. After the elevator scene, Harry tells Jack that he won't be there all the time, and Jack doesn't seem to really take it in until it's too late. Jack doesn't hold many connections until he meets Annie and the passengers. We only know so much about the passengers as you would riding a real bus, but as the situation gets more intense, the bonds between the characters begin to form and the walls come down. Pain is really the shadow side of Jack, of someone who was cast off after an accident and feels little, if any, compassion at all for anyone. Hence his brilliant line, I wish I had a loftier purpose, but in the end, it's just the money. Even by the end of the movie, Jack rediscovers his compassionate side and stays with the handcuffed Annie when the metro train crashes. When both survive, it leads to a very romantic ending for the two. Even though the theme is small, it's still detectable and gives speed a human edge which a lot of the 90s movies action lacked. During a time when action movie quality was fluctuating wildly and there was a shift towards scaled down protagonists and high concept plots for the audiences to grasp, Speed came out and made its mark. This movie proved a cut above the rest and proved that an action movie set on a bus of all things could not only work, but become part of our culture. It's fast, exciting, and is told exceptionally well. The cast is quite strong in this movie, and never really hit false notes. It's a slick thrill ride from start to finish. My final ranking, 9 out of 10. If you're wondering if I'm going to do Speed 2, okay, I'll do it right now. Speed 2. Cruise control. It sucks. End of story. Thank you very much.